In this screencast, we'll develop the inertial kinematics using the path frame. So recall what we have is along some path, we have a particle P. It has a speed in a direction. We'll just call that V. <clears throat> and then we've defined two vectors. We've defined a tangential vector that's part of the path frame. And then we've defined a vector that's in the concave direction called the normal vector. So these are our primary vectors that we'll use for the path frame. We've also defined one additional vector, which is our binormal vector, which is the cross product of E sub t with E sub n. And so to make this useful for Newton's second law, in which we need to observe the acceleration of particle p in an inertial reference frame, we need to define the velocity of p with respect to O, as observed in the inertial reference frame, and then differentiate this to get the acceleration of P in the inertial reference frame. So for the velocity, velocity of P as observed in the inertial reference frame, this is going to be our speed. We need a magnitude and a direction, so our magnitude is our speed V, and then our direction is in the ET direction. So nice and simple for the velocity. We're done. There is no, so let's point out here that there is no velocity in the normal direction. It's only tangent to the path. But now for our, our acceleration, we're going to differentiate our velocity. And we're differentiating the velocity as observed in the inertial reference frame, and we're differentiating as observed in the inertial reference frame to get the acceleration as observed in the inertial reference frame. And so to differentiate this first term in the e sub t direction, we're going to use our product rule, so we'll end up with a v dot, so this is our magnitude of our acceleration in the e sub t direction, and then using the product rule, it'll be the speed multiplied times the time differentiation of our basis vector e sub t. And we've already developed a tool to be able to handle this differentiation of a basis vector. So we know that the time differentiation, as observed in the inertial reference frame, of E sub t is going to be equal to omega v, as observed in i, crossed with the unit vector E sub t. And so now we're tasked with finding out what this omega b, as observed in i, is. And, and recall this is where the b reference frame is our path frame. And then we're relating this to an inertial reference frame, which here we'll just consider fixed like what we had in the previous screencast. So conceptually, let's understand what's happening here, is that we have a reference frame that's being defined by the path and being defined by a tangential vector along the path. And so you can see conceptually that the frame itself, the basis vector, E sub t, is going to rotate as it travels along the path. And that's the rotation that we're capturing in this omega b as observed in i. So to parameterize this into something that we know, let's zoom in on a section of that curve and define the geometry. And so what we'll do is we'll say that at any location on a curve that the particle p exists, then we can fit a circle that defines that curve. And so now by fitting this circle at point P, we can focus on a very small portion at point P that we'll call DS. So DS is an infinitesimally small portion along the path. So notice that we've introduced here this S, which is our path coordinate, and then a small change in that path coordinate that occurs where the point of the circle or where the circle touches the trajectory. I should note also that this circle has a name. It's called an osculating circle. Osculating is, uh, has a Latin origin, which means to kiss. So the circle itself is just kissing this point at which uh, is point P, which is the location of our particle on our path. Now this circle that we've defined here, it has geometry. So if we say that the center of the circle is here, and at this point that we're concerned with, at point P, we're looking at this small distance ds, and then the circle at this point in time has a radius r sub c. This is called the radius of curvature, and then this change in angle, we'll call d theta, 
and this small change in angle is related to this small change in path or path coordinate due to this radius of curvature. And we know this as a change in arc length where we have ds is equal to our radius of curvature multiplied times d theta. So now let's rearrange these terms so we have d theta is equal to 1 over our radius of curvature multiplied times ds and then we can use Leibniz notation where we divide both sides by dt and then we recognize that d theta over dt is the same as theta dot and then we get uh, 1 over our radius of curvature and then ds over dt is the same as s dot and s dot is the speed of the particle and we've already said that our speed of the particle, we'll just call this v for simplicity. And so we get that theta dot is equal to v over our radius of curvature. Now we'll see the advantage of defining the binormal direction because omega v as observed in i is always going to be equal to theta dot in the binormal direction or our speed divided by our radius for curvature in the binormal direction. And so now let's plug this back into our expression because remember we're after the time derivative as observed in the inertial reference frame of the tangential vector which is omega cross e sub t. And so by substituting in we get v over our radius of curvature of the binormal vector cross with e sub t and then this will give us v over our radius of curvature. The binormal cross with the tangential vector is the normal vector. And now back to our acceleration expression, we have the acceleration of point P as observed in the inertial reference frame will be V dot, so this is our change in speed in the E sub T direction, and then we'll add to this, we had V, our speed, now it's multiplied times the time derivative of our uh, tangential vector, and we know that that's equal to V over or our speed over our radius of curvature in the en direction, and so we get v squared over the radius of curvature in the en direction. And so what you should notice is that we've come up with a, a really nice expression now for our acceleration as observed in the inertial reference frame. And now we have our two components that we've discussed that cause acceleration. We have a change in speed, and this is a change in speed along the path, and because we've defined an osculating circle, this change in speed squared divided by the radius of curvature of that circle, if we know the radius of curvature, gives us the what's called the normal component of the acceleration, always pointed in the concave direction, and this is de denoting our change in direction. So let's quickly relate these terms back to what you already know from the polar frame. So this first term, which we're calling our tangential acceleration, is our change in speed, and in the polar frame, Recall that that was an r theta double dot term. And so in this case, with our osculating circle at this, this instant in time, this could be our radius of curvature times theta double dot. Likewise, we defined in our polar frame our acceleration due to our change in direction. We used a centripetal acceleration. And the magnitude of that centripetal acceleration was a radius. In this case, would be a radius of curvature multiplied times a theta dot squared. And to demonstrate that, we would say we have our speed squared divided by our radius of curvature, and we're inserting for our speed, it's our radius of curvature multiplied times theta dot, that's all squared divided by the radius of curvature, and so that gives us our radius of curvature multiplied times our uh, angular speed squared. Now we've defined these, uh, this relationship to the, the polar frame, with these magnitudes. But notice here that the direction here for our centripetal acceleration, or what we're calling our normal acceleration here, is positive when we're talking about the path frame, but we always use a negative sign, if you recall, from the polar frame. Now the difference here, remember, is that the normal vector is always going to be pointed in the concave direction. And we would, when we developed the polar frame, we talked about the centripetal acceleration, which is maintaining, it's due to a constraint force maintaining you on a path, is always going to be in the negative e sub r direction because of how we define the frames. So that's an important difference to point out between the polar frame and the path frame in this respect. 
A natural question at this point is how do we know the radius of curvature at the point at which I'm on the path? And for that, we apply a simple equation based on our Cartesian coordinates in which we say that the radius of curvature is equal to 1 plus dy over dx squared, and it's this entire quantity raised to the 3 half divided by d squared y over dx squared, and that's the absolute value. Now it's important to point out here that we don't need to know all of the x and y coordinates or have a well-defined path for the entire trajectory, but we only need to know the change in y over the change in x at this point that we're interested in to be able to define this radius of curvature. And so if we know that information, we can get the radius of curvature. With the radius of curvature, if we know the speed then we, and the change in speed, then we have all the information that we need for the acceleration, which we can apply in Newton's second law to solve for an equation of motion.